And I do all of this with a supercomputer. Um, and so we have these uh, very high performance codes that we work with as a community, um, several that do the equivalent things so that we have some tests to compare to. And um, with these programs, we solve complex differential equations um, that are actually modifying what's hap or actually simulating which what, what is happening with gravity. Um, or, uh, for example, gas physics, uh, plasma physics, um, stellar physics. Um, my particular interest is gravity, so that's kind of what I'll focus on. But the important thing to realize about these simulations is we want to get them to be um, the highest resolution, the highest accuracy as possible, because we want to be able to compare them to reality in the end and make robust predictions. So some of these simulations, um, they started out uh, maybe at the tens of particles at the advent of the field in the 1930s and 40s, where the simulation, gravity is an inverse squared force, and um, so is the intensity of a light. So some of the initial simulations were actually done by moving light bulbs around. <laughs> So 10 light bulbs moving carefully around, measuring the intensity at, at every different point. But nowadays, we've moved up to billions and soon trillions of, of particles. Um, and this generates a huge amount of data um, that we need to process and analyze and visualize and make sense of um, in science. And here I am at the real-time conference. Um, and I will talk a little bit about some of my work in real-time analysis and visualization in computational astrophysics and also give, if I have time, a few examples from everything from CERN to uh, radio astronomy to energy, where um, domains that were previously done um, kind of offline high performance computing are now done uh, in real time, um, if I get time there. Um, I'm also in general interested in some of the stuff that you guys are coming up with today. I'm a hobbyist iPhone developer um, and Android now. Um, and I have um, iPhone apps that have been featured kind of all over the web, have over 100,000 downloads, and most of these are client-side only. Um, Encyclopedia stores all of Wikipedia offline on your phone um, in any one of 83 languages. Um, Circle of Six is a safety application mainly targeted at women. Um, that's anti-sexual assault. Um, Click is a video messaging application, and I just started a new uh, game for iOS that teaches kids some of the principles of orbital mechanics. So um, most of these are, are kind of um, client side, but I have done some server side stuff mainly in, um, in Python, but I'm really curious um, to try out Node one of these days. And that will be the only time I mention Node in this talk, so enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's, let's move on uh, to, to science. So um, I'm going to tell you what parallel computing is. Uh, which is a more general term than um, high-performance computing, and I'll tell you what I mean when I say high-performance computing. So parallel computing can be a shared memory machine. Um, it can be a distributed memory machine. It can be single instruction, multiple data, multiple instruction, multiple data, or you can have functional parallelism. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about when I say um, high-performance computing here is distributed memory and multiple instruction, multiple data. And in practice, a lot of times, in my particular field, and I can't generalize to all fields, um, this is done via C, C++, or Fortran, so really low-level languages that are close to the hardware, um, and using uh, uh, the message passing interface, which I'll actually go over um, some example code using that with, with visualization. And that's basically um, uh, a way to send and receive data on a distributed memory cluster. Um, MP is uh, to make use of multiple cores locally. And now, uh, more and more, um, used to be FPGAs, but now more and more, if we have uh, the access to GPUs on a supercomputer, we're trying to use that power as well to accelerate our computations. Um, so uh, the basic is that you, um, on every node of your cluster, you're going to communicate somehow um, and then actually do some computation and just kind of iterate through this uh, during your simulation. So communication steps and then computation steps. And that's kind of the basics. Of course, it gets much more complicated when you actually are solving um, a difficult um, equation. 
So some grand challenges in science and high performance computing, I won't read them all, but it, um, it ranges across uh, science. And I've even seen now, um, in Switzerland, we have a supercomputing research center. And one of the projects that was funded was actually an anthropology project to simulate the migration of Neanderthals um, and try to figure out uh, the origins of, of humanity. So I could even add anthropology to this list. Um, so high performance computing, just like real time computing, is kind of making inroads in places that um, we hadn't seen it before. Um, many anthropologists are learning how to program now, for example. So um, in high performance computing, uh, typically, and this is where I'll make the transition to real time high performance computing, we might do um, a simulation or take in some data here in this diagram, it's from a radio telescope, and then do some analysis that can take who knows how long. We try to do it as quickly as possible, but it's done offline. So the sensor can be continuously collecting data um, while in the background maybe the analysis takes 10, 20, 100 times as long as it took to collect the data, but that's no problem in traditional high performance computing um, or to generate the data in my example of a simulation. Uh, in real time, you might, uh, maybe you're not able to store the amount of data in real time that your telescope generates or that your simulation generates. Um, so you have to, if you have any hope of using it all, either um, only use a subset of the data that is being generated or try to do as much of that analysis that you used to do offline kind of online. And that's where the, the real time comes in. So um, high performance computing and, and real time computing, um, they're both demanding computational intensity. We're now dealing with larger and larger size of data sets. And in particular, um, HPC, uh, the real time constraints often come from a large number of IO channels that you literally just can't write data to disk fast enough, or maybe you don't even have the disk storage space to store every output of your simulation. Um, so this is being used in everything, as I mentioned, from plasma control, adaptive optics and very large telescopes, smart electrical grid control, high resolution medical imaging, hardware in the loop um, simulations, and as well um, for uh, my large-scale simulations and my group's large-scale simulations. Um, so these simulations can generate terabytes and terabytes of data. Um, we step forward in time uh, from shortly after the Big Bang in our terminology, so about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, which is when we have some of our first observations of uh, what the universe was like, and we evolve that forward and try to compare um, whether we have our theoretical physics models screwed on correctly or not, and also make some predictions and inform observations where exactly they should be pointing their telescopes, um, where exactly uh, they should be looking for statistical anomalies or things that they may not expect. Um, and for these simulations, because they are so large scale and so complex, um, there are a couple really real time needs. Um, one, would be when the simulation has already been generated, it's stored to disk, so we're kind of abstracting out that problem. And when a scientist, such as myself, goes ahead and tries to work with and analyze and make sense of the data. Um, so what scientists often do um, in my lab and many other labs is they'll run some script that they wrote um, or that their advisor wrote, and then they wait a little bit, and then they get an image, and then they get that image back, and then they make sense of it. And that image could be a plot, it could be an actual um, image representation of the data, but it, it's very um, plotting. So if you want to, for example, say you're developing a new code, um, you're trying to debug a problem, um, it takes a while to do that. Maybe the image takes 20 minutes to generate or something like that if it's a billion particles. Uh, another issue with this is that if that's just done locally, a lot of analysis is done locally on on one machine, um, then you're limited by the amount of memory that your analysis machine has because it's just one node. Um, so ideally, you would want to be able to load in an entire simulation of, at once, say a terabyte or whatever, and in, interact with that in real time 
um, go in and out, do plots, etc., um, all in real time as a, as a scientist. Um, and as part of, um, I'm not doing a PhD, this was part of my master's thesis and is under continued development, I developed a toolkit uh, building on an open source um, platform to do exactly this. And um, the platform itself is called Paraview. It's built on top of um, VTK, which is a visualization <coughs> toolkit. And it has a couple um, key components that helps um, anyone, basically, plug in to do real-time distributed visualization and analysis tasks. And um, one of those is the, let me see if this is my next slide. No. I'll go back to code later. <laughs> um, the uh, real-time visualization uh, compositing algorithm. So in this little example, um, there's a component of Paraview called Ice-T. And if, in this example, we are rendering for two displays, one, two, um, over six nodes, this rocket, one, two, three, four, five, six. And each individual node uh, renders um, its component, the data that it has locally. Um, and then the ICT renderer, using communication calls, automatically um, sorts this uh, with respect to a point of view. So this sorting will be different if we look at the rocket from this way. Um, then we'll basically just see this um, versus the other way. We'll, we'll just see this versus the front. Um, and ICT basically handles um, all of that compositing in real time, which is great. Um, another thing that it um, has is a concept called level of detail, which is very important um, when you're interacting with um, a simulation or a visualization in real time, you don't want it to freeze while it's rendering. You still want to be able to move around. And then when you release the mouse, that's when you actually really, really care about the level of detail. And so uh, it has a concept of level of detail, of how fast is your latency to the server, um, what is your data transfer rate, et cetera. And it can degrade your visualization accordingly. Um, so here we have a degraded visualization, but we can still see the main features um, of uh, these are actual little vectors representing velocity that there's some um, interesting stuff going on here. So if you wanted to rotate uh, to this, you would be able to do that. And then when you let go, it then again renders at the, the highest level of detail. So that's a little bit about the real-time visualization um, uh, component, and now I'll get to a little bit of code um, to show uh, one example of how um, a message passing uh, works in um, in a scientist's mind, uh, which is a little bit different from zero MQ, etc. But um, also uh, how much there is, uh, how primitive what we do is compared to what could be done. So there is a lot of knowledge transfer that I think. Uh, could happen on, on both sides here, potentially. So the example that I'll give, and it looks a little hairy at first, is calculating uh, the moment of inertia tensor. <laughs> and so here, um, first thing that you should notice is that this is uh, symmetric. So this component is the same as that one, actually, in the end. And the second is that these seemingly complicated formulae um, actually uh, this is, say, over n particles, so it's summing from 1 to n. Um, they're not dependent on each other. The different particles aren't dependent um, in, in the formulae. So you could conceivably divide this data set in four chunks uh, and compute this value on each of your four nodes. And then the final value is just the sum of those. Um, and it's the same, actually, for each component. So basically, what you do is you divide up your data set. Um, you take the sum of all your localized data, and then the final computation, you need the sum of the result from each of your individual nodes. Um, and then you need to do, that gives you the value of this, and then to get the final answer um, for uh, the moment of inertia, you need to diagonalize that. So do some linear algebra on your final answer. So each individual node only needs to sum things up, and um, either you can collect those results uh, in a clever way via a tree, but what I'll give, um, to simplify the code here and simplify the, the thought process, I'm going to have just a root node collect all the results of um, the worker nodes, 
and do the, the final, final computation. Um, so here is a little bit of code. Uh, first, we're going to check if we're able to operate in parallel or not. Um, in general, uh, my visualization toolkit works also on a, a, a serial um, computation. Um, so here, uh, if we are operating in parallel, that's here. We check our process ID, and that's kind of how you figure out if you're a special process, say the root process versus a worker process, um, and then the total number of processes, which is here. Um, so in my hypothetical example, that could be four, and these uh, update pieces could be anywhere from zero to three, so zero, one, two, or three, and the total number of pieces would be four. Okay, so then um, this is an example use of MPI, and um, every individual um, process, no matter its process ID, um, imagine we calculated a center of mass somewhere up here, and um, we're going to broadcast that um, synced center of mass. Um, and if you've already calculated that, um, I had just the root process calculate that, then the result is already in there and it's broadcasting it. If not, um, processes, um, you're actually receiving the data um, from that root process. So everyone calls that, and if you're the root process, you're sending it, and the other processes, you're receiving it. And this is basically the size of your array, x, y, and z, so three. Um, so then uh, we're going to uh, update, um, and that basically is doing that um, local sum. Um, and then if you're not the root process, you're going to send your result to the root um, and uh, exit because you're basically done. But if you are, well, let's see. This is the actual, um, yeah, here's the process zero. So process zero goes to all other processes, one through three in our little example, and it actually receives the result of that computation, um, updates its, uh, its tensor, and then finally performs this, this linear algebra in the end and displays the results. And I think we had, maybe it was back here, um, this is an example of, this is the center of mass that was computed, and these were those uh, results that, that were computed. So it also ends up displaying it as well. So that's a little example of uh, parallel um, analysis, which for a small data set, you could do that locally. For a big data set, um, it may not even fit in um, local memory. So you are forced to do it, um, do it in parallel. Um, and in this case, since the user is wanting to see the result directly, um, you have to, to view it in real time. And so that's a little overview. Um, what I wrote here was a Paraview plugin on top of Paraview, which is using C++, OpenGL, optionally MPI. The GUI is in Qt. Um, and then there's also wrappers in, in scripting, scripting languages. Um, so here's uh, another example of real-time analysis, which is very similar, except you're binning um, in uh, uh, radius, so you're only computing values um, or computing results for things which lie in between particular radii, and you can also do um, uh, plots. Uh, so that used that real-time computed um, uh, values as a function of radius and actually went ahead and plotted it. And the neat thing there is that if you change something, this is very dependent on your center because a radius is relative to a center. If, say, I change my center, as a scientist, I just drag it, you'll see that change in real time as well. Um, and just a little note about data splitting. So here um, in my initial example, um, splitting up data was really easy because um, no particular um, particle depended on any other particle. And this little example here, I have a space invader, and I want to compute the edge of the space invader. So I'm going to split that up among three particles, or three uh, nodes, sorry. 
And um, if I just have the nodes individually compute the edge, then I'll get some edges wrong. I'll figure out that this is an edge, which is wrong. That whole thing is not an edge, just that little bit is. Um, and the same with here. I'll make some errors. So in general, to get this computation right, I have to do something called make a ghost cell or be a little bit more clever. So here's an example using the concept of a ghost cell, which is basically I duplicate some data among processes. And those are these white cells here. Um, and basically any, um, any piece which would have had a neighbor piece that was put on a, another processor, that piece is duplicated across both of those processors. And in this case, with just one level of these ghost cells, um, you're able to correctly, uh, you compute the edge, then you discard the ghost cells, and when you recomposite, you get the right result. And you can see that this is very uh, dependent on the spatial distribution of, of these cells themselves, so that if, for example, instead of logically dividing um, the space invader in three parts by how it looks like in space, if I were to give this to processor one, this to processor two, this to processor three, one, two, three, one, two, three, I would end up with a hell of a lot of ghost cells, uh, which takes up memory and computation time in the end unnecessarily. So it really makes sense in this case, um, since our final algorithm is spatially dependent, to um, distribute the data among processes in a spatially dependent way. And here's an example of data partitioning among uh, four processors. Um, initially, a lot of these um, high resolution particles, if you just distribute the data among these processes, each color is a different process. By the order that you read it in the file, unless the file has spatial information, um, you're going to end up with, especially in the high resolution region where the the order of the file didn't really correspond to spatial information, um, a lot of mixture in space there. Whereas if you are very careful um, to partition your data um, in a spatially competent way, then you'll end up being able to do some uh, analysis and visualization um, tasks a little bit more efficiently. So I'm not going to get to go into um, the case studies of power grid, of this uh, radar um, telescope of CERN, unfortunately, or of superconducting magnets, but these are all examples of places where real-time computing um, is both enabling science and preventing disasters in high-performance computing. Um, and I'll kind of close with, this is a visualization of a crystal ball by someone on DeviantArt with um, both thinking about using some things that I've um, already heard about um, and have started to prototype, for example, doing some of these more simplistic MPI computations using zero MQ, et cetera, which would be much more fault tolerant right now if one of your nodes goes down. Um, in your computation, you have to reset the entire computation in the current um, commonly used implementations of MPI. And when you're scaling up to 100,000 nodes, one of your nodes is going to go down, and it's going to be a day of work, a day of computation that is lost uh, trying to, to restart that. So it's really important that we start to think about um, some of the things that uh, people in other communities have, have done for financial engineering, et cetera, um, in high performance computing as well. But perhaps you can also start to think about um, if you really need um, an efficient computation um, in the back end. Nowadays, you can spin up a high-performance computing cluster uh, with Amazon. So you can start to think about using some HPC techniques that we've developed um, to help you be even more real-time. Okay, thank you very much.